Hello and welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Decatur, where a museum charts the career of one of Decatur's most famous residents. Hieronymus Mueller was a visionary, and his inventions and developments live on here in a new museum adjacent to the company he founded. As you walk into the Mueller Museum, one of the most striking things is this turn of the century car, and I mean turn of the last century car. Yeah. This is this is the, the Mueller Benz, huh? This is a Mueller Benz. Uh, Hieronymus Mueller uh, was an inventor, and an inventor happened, who happened to also hate horses. He just didn't care for horses at all. So when he found out that uh, an automobile was being produced in Germany, the Benz uh, car, he had one imported to Decatur, you know, certainly one of the first cars in Illinois, or earliest ones, and, and definitely the first car in Decatur. Uh, when he got it here, he didn't like it, and being an inventor and a tinkerer, he immediately set out to rebuild it to suit himself. <laughs> One of the things that the Benz car didn't have in 1892 was it didn't have a reverse gear, which mm -hmm. he thought was inconvenient to have to get out and push the car backwards if you got into a tight spot, so he put in a reverse gear mm -hmm. uh, and kept modifying. He built 12 cars over an eight year period uh, this car represents number seven uh, in that line of mm -hmm. cars. Uh, he and his sons added several inventions to it. The uh, water-cooled radiator that you can see on the front of this one, and yeah. uh, he, in addition to his reverse gear, uh, they did some engine modifications, including a spark plug uh, that they had patented, and the a distributor to go with the spark plug that they patented. Uh, had quite a, quite a few innovations. No two of the cars were alike. They never mass produced a car uh, mm -hmm. or got close to doing that. Mm -hmm. But he really had an interest in it and he was enough, he was good enough at, and mechanical enough that he was actually able to get patents on parts. Oh okay. yes, mm -hmm. as I say, they had 12 pretty significant patents mm -hmm. uh, on, on automobiles. Unfortunately, he was working on a modification uh, to the carburetor and uh, caused a, a fire which uh, caused fatal burns to Hieronymus and he died in 1900 as a result oh of, of that work. Mm -hmm. And if we look at, now if we look past the car, on the wall is a photograph of this car with William Jennings Bryan in it? Well, it's not, it's not this model of a car, but one of his cars, mm -hmm. which, which incidentally carried the name Mueller Benz. If you look through old automobile books, mm -hmm. it's, it's a significant enough development in automobiles that it has its own name, mm -hmm. Mueller Benz, but that's a, that is a Mueller Benz uh, with William Jennings Bryan, who appeared here in Decatur to make a speech, mm -hmm. uh, getting his first car ride uh, in the Mueller Benz, mm -hmm. along with Hieronymus and for his wife Frederica. The cars also were involved in the first auto race uh, that was held in the United States. Uh, Chicago newspaper sponsored the first auto race in 1895 up in Chicago, and. Uh, Hieronymus entered his car. One of the one of his sons drove the car uh, in that race. Uh, the first day they they won the race, but a missed race was declared because none of the other cars finished. So on a rerun of the race, <laughs> the second day uh, he finished second. So he had, actually had a pretty good design, a pretty reliable design to to uh, show that he f he finished both days, right. both races. When that was that in and of itself was a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and it was mechanically sound enough to, to uh, be among the better running cars as well. Well, Mike Detheridge, let's, let's uh, just sort of briefly recall how Hieronymus Mueller got here in the first place and, and uh, sort of look at, at how his, his journey into becoming an inventor and a, and a very, uh, a very uh, um, successful businessman. Uh, yes, well, Hieronymus Mueller was, was almost the prototypical success story of you know an immigrant coming to this country for opportunity and, and finding it. Uh, he was born in Germany in 1832, uh, trained uh, and apprenticed as a machinist, but he got into some trouble. There was some political upheaval in Germany at the time and he was part of a young radical group uh, and was accused at least of having participated in blowing up a bridge, uh, which made things uncomfortable for him in Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. So he uh, decided that the United States might represent some opportunity. Uh, left uh, in the early 1850s and came to uh, to the United States 
bumming around for a couple of years, probably in the New York and Chicago area, uh, joining a couple of brothers in Freeport, Illinois. Uh, and they in turn told him to come to Decatur because Decatur was a junction of two railroads. Mm -hmm. And railroads in the mid 1800s meant growth and opportunity. They told him that he could establish a business here. He was just starting his family. And uh, so that's how he ended up here. There's his picture up there, right? That's Hieronymus at an yeah. early age. And yeah. uh, his wife, Frederica, who was a Prussian immigrant mm -hmm. that he met in Freeport. And they settled in Decatur. Uh, he set up a gunsmithing shop. That's what, as a machinist, that's one of the skills that he had. And uh, this is a shotgun that he made. Uh, also was a, a locksmith, uh, sort of a jack of all trades if it had to do with uh, metals and metalworking and tinkering, he, mm -hmm. he did it. Uh, he got named uh, to the position of the first city plumber of, of Decatur, which is an odd sounding position. <laughs> they were starting to put in municipal waterworks mm -hmm. back then and uh, uh, there were no plumbers as such. They just yeah. needed someone with some mechanical skills. Mm -hmm. so. They called upon him to do that, and he took over the job uh, in the 1870s, and turned out that he, he actually enjoyed that. It turned, gave him something for his inventive skills back this and direction. brought him really his greatest success, yes, this, which was to develop. It, he almost stumbled accidentally into, uh, into his uh, most successful invention, I suppose, which is the Mueller tapping machine. The problem that they had was how do you how do you connect a new water service or a new home to an existing water main without having to drain all of the water out of the main mm -hmm. uh, and have everybody lose water pressure while you drill a hole into the water main and, and put a new connection in? It required the use of a tapping machine. Other people had tried to invent tapping machines and there were some others that were in use, uh, but they weren't really very practical didn't work uh, the way that people wanted. This is still being used now, isn't it, Mike? Yes, this it same is. Same design. Yes. And same Mueller Company still makes a tapping mm -hmm. machine. Still looks very similar to this mm -hmm. uh, in in its uh, design, a little bit uh, more sophisticated mm -hmm. appearing, but uh, it still does the same thing. He invented a, a a tap, a combination drill and tap. If you can see, the first part of the the drill and tap has a a drill bit on it, but then it it, you just keep pushing that down into the hole and it threads the pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a tapered thread, which is uh, something that Mueller had a patent on uh, that allows them to, to thread something into the pipe and get a tight seal without putting so much pressure on the pipe that it would crack mm -hmm. it, which mm -hmm. is another problem. But this machine allows them to put the hole in the pipe, put the threads in the pipe, and insert a valve into the pipe all without losing water. Uh, all through this machine. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it's still in use today, not only in water pipes, but gas pipes as well. Uh, and the, I, the machines the company makes now will do it in plastic pipe, any kind of pipe you yeah. come up with. Uh, so it was quite, quite a significant invention. Uh, it made his reputation. Everybody around the country wanted a Mueller tapping machine, and mm -hmm. every water system in the country today has a Mueller tapping machine. <laughs> Well, Mike, a lot of manufacturing firms were involved in the war effort, and, and Mueller was too. Um, but they really actually had a significant invention, didn't they? Yes, they did. Uh, of course, they turned to munitions production here because it was a brass foundry, and uh, you get into brass, you get into munitions. But their engineering department uh, uh, made a fairly significant uh, uh, contribution to the war effort over and above just producing munitions. They developed the first round, or the first artillery round, that was able to pierce Rommel's armor in North Africa. They were having a lot of problems then with the munitions of the ordnance they had just bouncing off uh, the heavy German armor. And uh, so they developed a shell uh, here in Decatur that could do that and were recognized for their effort with an E award from, from uh, the Department of the Army for having developed that shell, mm -hmm. shipped a lot of those shells out to North Africa. Mm -hmm. I'll bet. Well, Jane Mueller, you're the great-granddaughter of Hieronymus Mueller, and um, one of only a couple of Muellers still living in Decatur, and you are the family foundation. You're part of the Mueller Family Foundation, which 
built this beautiful museum. Yes. It's, it is, it's a, great, a great piece of work. Thank you. Yeah. We're very proud of it. I'll bet you are. <laughs> and it's fortunate that you are actually on, on the site with the Mueller company, so there's a, that connection remains, doesn't it? Yes. They've been extremely wonderful to provide the opportunity to lease the land and all the other support they've given to us in the way of artifacts and exhibits and time. It's just been marvelous. Mm -hmm. And the moral support we've gotten from them has just been terrific. Mm -hmm. how, when you walk through here, how do, you, how do you feel? It must make you feel... Very proud. I'll bet. I'll bet. And pleased. And happy that we can share it with the community. As a family, we've always done things very quietly and anonymously, and I think most of us prefer to continue doing things like that. But there comes a time when you do have a wealth of history and ha as it involves a relationship with the community and the area and the growth of those areas. So we felt it was necessary to share this with the community before it's lost. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the company and the family kept a lot of things. And as you can see the result of that here, a lot of local industry have not, has not kept their artifacts and their important historical things, so they can't share what they had, as we've been able to do. Right, right. And, you know, a lot of, uh, not only youngsters, but people who grew up in Decatur and sort of took Mueller for granted, never knew much about it, would be fascinated, I think, to learn that, that Hieronymus was somewhat of a pioneer in many fields. I think so, in areas that you wouldn't think of, like roller skates and um, lots of even um, fixtures such as those over there in that part of the museum. Uh, sinks and things like that that they used to do that they don't do any longer. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, Decatur is not a museum town and it takes people a long time to understand that we're here and once they come they are so pleasantly surprised with what we have to offer that it gives us hope that it may take long but we'll get the word around eventually mm -hmm. and people will start coming. Yeah. Jane, thank you. You're that. welcome. Well, Bob Abbott, you're with the Mueller Company, and um, you've been with the Mueller Company for, did you tell me, 21 years? Is no, that... 25. 25 years. Actually associated with them for almost 30. Yeah, okay. And uh, you, actually, you, you are muse kind of a museum hound. You describe yourself that way. <laughs> and you put so. together this display that's behind you, which shows uh, uh, where, shows people where your products, where Mueller that's products right. are located. That's right. Kind of, why don't you push a couple of those buttons for us so we can see what... You make well, hydrants, fire are, hydrants are one of our most uh, widely known products because we make almost half of the fire hydrants sold in the United States. And that's a huge number when you think of all of them that are out there. Yeah, okay. But this, uh, this display actually was one of the first um, displays that we developed to bring the company into the context of the museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is based on a piece of artwork that was actually done for the, the company's 100th anniversary. So many of the products in the illustration are, look rather old, but we basically make many of the same products. But when you push the button by the product below, it shows up in the schematic of a water distribution system where the products are located. So we've got hydrants and the brass valves, and there are just literally thousands of different brass valves that sure, we make. And so sure. on and so forth. Yeah. Um, when I was uh, talking to some folks doing background for this story, I talked to some people who work for the Mueller Foundation, which runs the museum, and they said the company had been really supportive. And uh, uh, so what was your role with the museum? Was it, did you actually have the property and, the, and bequeath the property to the foundation in order for them to build a museum? Well, oh, the property the museum is on, we, it's a long-term lease, that, uh, and then the foundation built the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But our association with the museum has gone back many, many years, even before the original building was, uh, our museum was established over by Scoville Park Zoo. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the artifacts were in the company's care, and of course, uh, a large volume of these uh, items were in the, com in the family's uh, possession. And a lot of it was commingled out at the company's foundry out, or not foundry, but the, um, the, uh, lodge out across the lake. Mm -hmm. And uh, many years ago when the company uh, was sold by the family, they uh, had to find a home for many of these artifacts. Yeah. And so the, the company's been involved with them since that time, uh, pulling things together, helping to uh, research some of the items to know what they are. And we're always on the lookout for new items for the museum. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes so much sense to have the museum here on, you know, at the Mueller site. It just, oh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, 
rather than way out there where nobody can find it. Well, it's a natural for us. Yeah. In fact, that's one of the things that was so attractive about having the museum here on our own property is that uh, the connection between the company and the family is just something that you can't break. And in fact, I, I've told people that uh, the uh, family history and the company's history are just so intertwined that it's just impossible to pull them apart. Mm -hmm. So it was just a natural to bring them out here. And plus, we, uh, the company does uh, product training. And we're uh, probably the only company in our industry that has a full-time staff that does training. So we bring hundreds of people into this area each year for uh, that type of training, and then it's a natural. It's just a great way for them to see some of the history because mm -hmm. there are things in this museum that even our own employees don't see. Right. So it, it, we just saw, viewed it as a wonderful chance to expand on our uh, product and our, our reputation there and help them get a, a little context. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Well, Ruth Wampler, you and your brother, Marvin Ford, are among the oldest retirees from the Mueller Company. Your brother is 100, and you're 91, soon to be 92. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, you had two husbands that also worked right. at the Mueller Company. It yeah. was kind of like a family affair, wasn't it? Yeah, and I had two brothers and one sister, and I don't remember how many cousins. And I think I even had a, I know I had an uncle or two. Mm -hmm. So it was family. Mm -hmm. But that's funny. I never did ever wake up and not want to go to work. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You worked at Mueller during the war, yeah. during World War II. And that's why we're sitting in front of these shells, et cetera, and things that, that you oh helped make, boy. huh? Well, I didn't make any of them, but I sure handled a lot of them. You did? Yeah, one time they had me on the, on the big one. Uh -huh. And the, the tools that they used were so heavy, I couldn't even lift them. And uh, so they took me off that and put me on the, the smaller one, mm -hmm. the 57s. I used to lift one up here and hold it under a light and then put it down over here. I had a lot of muscle that you, went You that. must have. Those were big shells. Yeah. You were checking them for, I guess. Cracks. Oh, cracks. OK. Or okay. any flaw in it that mm -hmm. we could find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were there a lot of women working in the plant? Yeah, there was quite a few yeah. at that time. Yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of women inspectors. Some of them were even working on the machines. But I never had to do that, thank God. Yeah, boy, you'd have really been strong if you had Oh, boy. Know, but, no, after the war, they stopped making those things, and I went into the two-room office. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that quite a bit, because I had a good, a good supervisor. That was better than being in the plant, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Marvin, working at Mueller in Decatur was kind of a family affair for a lot of people, wasn't it? Well, um, of course, I was the only one that started working here at Mueller's because my folks were in North Dakota. I was born in Illinois, but raised in North Dakota. Uh, I was 25 years old when I left up there. Oh, I see. And. Uh, of course, my first job, I worked at the, in the uh, foundry. I come down, uh, I forget the personnel man at that time. Uh, he was kind of a funny guy anyway. But uh, the, his assistant kind of took, took to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that really hired me for the foundry. Because the other guy, he said, oh, he said he'll get homesick and go back to North Dakota. Well, I didn't. I stayed there till the job went out. And of course, they had a night shift. They cut the night shift off, and I was working days. Mm -hmm. Of course, when the night shift went off, I got right off, too. And uh, so I was out of work for almost, well, till March. This was in January, mm -hmm. 7th of January. And uh, in March, well, I was staying with my uncle there, and my cousin called and told me, hey, there's a corn shucking job down here at Sutton Bristol kind of teed me off a little bit to get a job, you know. So I went back to Mueller's, and this same 
assistant personnel man, he was still there. And he said, well, they, they, they need a man out to plant three, the Victor's plant. And they sent me out there. And my foreman was, uh, Fisher was his name. I forget his first name now. He was the foreman. He told me, you worked up real good. Maybe this plant manager will keep you. So I did. He kept me. <laughs> he kept you all right. He uh, kept you for the rest of your career, didn't yeah, he? Just almost. Now, now you're, you're 100 years old. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I'm 100. You'll be 101. November 12th. In November. Yeah. And you're the, I guess, the oldest retiree. Yeah, I am now. A few years ago, I, I personnel man, I, a person I asked, said I'm about the oldest person, he said, no, there's one other person older than you, <laughs> and it was a woman. Yeah, I see, I and see. She, of course, she died. Right, right. But <clears throat> anyway, um, I w went out to plant three out there, and, and uh, my, jo <clears throat> my job was to grind the backs of the, the tanks so that they, uh, I hang them up on the wall, just mm -hmm. like they would hang on the wall, you know, had a couple pins up there and hang on them. And, uh, and then I had to fit the lid on it so the lid wouldn't rock. Mm -hmm. and, and I did that for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and the man worked, worked on the other side. It was a big grinder that had a big shaft of so iron wheels on it, about four foot. Uh, and they, the stone was set underneath the rim, clamped on there. Mm -hmm. And you, you ground on the side here. And uh, he ground the backs of those laboratories squared them up, mm -hmm. and the urinals, and all that, all that kind of work. He did all that. And, uh, but if we had any work to do out in the shipping department, or in, the, in the warehouse, well, we had to go out there and stack mm -hmm. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. this, this is, uh, you were, uh, I guess, among the last people at Mueller to work in this vitreous plant. Yeah, huh? of course, I know I am. Yeah. I don't know of anyone. The, the last guy that I knew died here mm -hmm. a few years ago. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I can remember when he got married out there, too. <laughs> well, Vernon, there is a display in the museum here about family members who worked at Mueller, and it's interesting. One of them says, be careful what you say about any Mueller employee. Chances are they're related. And that's really true, isn't it? That is very true. <laughs> yeah. We looked at, just a moment ago, we looked at the number of people in your family that worked at the Mueller plant. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good number. Yeah, we're pretty proud of uh, our family that we've had work here over the years. Mm -hmm. You worked there from 19, let's see if I read it right, from 1954 to 1998. Right. That's a pretty long time. Yes, quite a few years. Yeah. They went fast, though. Did they? And, yes. Are you glad to be retired? Yes. Retirement's yes. going yes. okay? Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I missed it at first, but uh, retirement's going very well for mm -hmm. me. We're good. Listen, I want to ask you a couple of questions about some of the work that you did in the plant. Okay. And in order to do that, we can incorporate one of the displays here in the museum with what with some of the work that you did, and I'm holding a mold here, which is something that you that you uh, worked on, isn't it? This is a core. A core. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh huh. And you you were, had a hand in making those. Those feel like they're made out of sand. They're made out of sand. Yes, mm -hmm. a mixture of sand, and and uh, then they're formed and baked, and uh, and they come out very hard, um, and then they're uh, laid in the molds, and uh, the metals poured around them, and really. The core is the center of your casting. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and describe this for me. Uh, this is a, a rough casting. Uh, it's been cleaned. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the way it would lay in the, in the mold. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually your core would be going inside it. And uh, then these are taken out of the mold and they're put in what they called a wheel braider and they're, that's what they shake them out and they it cleans everything out of mm -hmm. the inside of them. Mm -hmm. And then they're sent uh, here to the plant to be machined. You had, you worked on sort of what might, it might be called an assembly line because you had a train, you, you worked on a train, train. track and, the, it, and these, these, these cars came in and you had to keep those loaded and going, didn't you? Right. Every six <laughs> minutes, it'd come in and pull out. And mm -hmm. uh, he's going to have them loaded while you had to load them within them six minutes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and our friend here that you see to your right, is he, uh, is he doing a job similar to what you had? No, I never poured metal. Never poured uh, metal? No. Huh? Okay. Uh, you had the train that moved around, you had one train being loaded, you had one train being cooled, uh, one train dumping, and one train being poured again. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and every one of them would have a different station that they'd be moving into at each time. And you had to keep up. Yes. If you didn't keep up, everything broke down, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> every now and then the train would break down. Yeah. We would kind of like that. And you'd that look forward time. to that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, Vernon, thanks for reliving some of this with us. It's, it's kind of neat that so many families had that connection uh, with the Mueller company. Well, we enjoyed, I think our whole family enjoyed the years that we've spent here. And I said, growing up, that's all we knew was Mueller company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, over the years, as we got old enough to go to work, why it was just kind of expected we was going to be going to work mm -hmm. at Mueller. So, yeah. Yeah. and it has been a, it's been a lot of good years, yeah. and it gave our whole family a very good living over these years, too. So, yeah, thank you very much for sharing that with okay. us. Okay. The Hieronymus Mueller Museum is open on Thursday to Saturday from 1 to 4 p.m. Our groups can call for an appointment. With another Illinois Story in Decatur, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. For a copy of the program you've just seen, send $19.95 for VHS or $24.95 for DVD to Network Knowledge, PO Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and the date the program aired. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.